Hi guys, welcome back to Infinite Possibilities, the podcast where we explore the lives of amazing people, their choices, challenges, and opportunities. And today, I have a very special guest, Annie. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, today we're in the pleasure of in Annie's office. Wow, it's so cool. It's a work of art. So if you, you know, <laughs> it's very messy, is what she means. So we're currently cramped into a corner. <laughs> Yeah, but it has artifacts everywhere. I'm like checking out, you know, Annie's childhood, checking out her baby photos. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's a lot of good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, Annie, what is your one minute introduction about what you do? Well, uh, I teach Indonesian language, but I'm an Indonesian historian. So uh, mainly focusing on modern Indonesia. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. And so we want to like take a look into Annie's childhood, see what kind of person she was like growing up. So, Annie, you know, what kind of child were you like growing up? Uh, am I allowed to swear? Oh, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I believe my parents called me a shit. Because <laughs> I was a shit. So. <laughs> Can you please elaborate? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I think uh, the word, what do they say on The Sound of Music? Uh, what's the word the boy says? I, I don't like, know. I think they call me, it's not presumptuous, what is it? <laughs> it's a word, anyway, it's like, I think you want to be treated like a boy. What is it? I've forgotten the word. Yeah. Oh, no, <laughs> but I was uh, very um, stubborn and did my own thing. Yeah. And yeah, just uh, whinged until I got my way. Yeah. Oh, my mm. way the highway. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Wow, that's kind of cool. And so what was high school like? How was it making friends and, you know, I guess not teacher's pet then? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, I went to a very small school in the country and uh, not that small, good school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I really liked it. And uh, so in those sorts of contexts, you grow up with the people who you go through with, through school with. So I uh, knew everybody in my class and was related to some of them because that's the other thing when you grow up in an area, you tend to be related to quite a few people as well. And yeah, so yeah, I had friends growing up sort of my whole life, you know, and, uh, and I'm still friends with a lot of them. So hmm. Yeah, very cool. Were you born in Australia? Yeah, 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 I was born in Australia. I was born in that little town. Um, and yeah, so my parents are still there and uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's very cool. And what about in terms of personality wise, were you very extroverted? I think so. Yeah, I think extroverted, um, but uh, not too naughty, <laughs> like medium naughty. Medium yeah. naughty, yeah. yeah. So I never got expelled. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good job. So, yeah, that's a win. <laughs> yeah. And so did you have a lot of siblings? No, just me and my sister, and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah. That's cool. And now that you know you're doing research and stuff like that, did you enjoy school as a child? I did, I did. I certainly uh, railed against certain aspects of school. I didn't oh, like for the example. Like I'm, I'm not very good at taking orders, <laughs> and uh, so I remember having many heated fights about things. But <laughs> I think that's normal. <coughs> Thanks, sorry. Um, yeah, no, no, it was, yeah, it was fine, it was good. Happy days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and what about, so first take a drink of water. Yes. Yeah, and then later we're going to talk about like maybe in terms of career aspirations when you were a child, mm -hmm. what they were, and then maybe like what kind of input your parents had about. Sure, 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 sure. What you should be. Yes, uh, well, um, I think my parents are extremely supportive and they would have, if I had decided to be anything, they would have supported it. Oh, so uh, nice. they didn't mind really what I did so long as I <laughs> worked hard at it. And uh, so both my sister and I went into very bizarre areas. Oh. And so my sister became like a plant ecologist. Wow, so thing. niche. Yes, and I became an Indonesian teacher. So two quite oh, yeah. random things. Oh, mm. and what, like, so I guess, like, um, was that in high school when you sort of got, like, got interested in Indonesian and she got interested in plants, or was that sort of later on? No, I think, well, for my sister, she was always a uh, committed environmentalist since she was a very small person, and, <laughs> um, you know, in that way, she was quite visionary, really. Yeah. Um, and 
uh, for me, I went on exchange to Indonesia when I was in high school for a few months and yeah. uh, that had a big impact on me. And I enjoyed languages anyway. I did maths and science as well, but I liked languages. And so, yeah, yeah it was a sort of natural progression for me. So oh, That's cool. And what were your languages at school? I did French, French. and Indonesian, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's cool. And tell me more about that exchange trip and like why Indonesia out of everywhere? You could have gone to France because you were studying. Could have gone to France. I ended up actually going on exchange a few times wow. in high school. Because uh, my parents were trying to get rid of me. No. <laughs> <laughs> that little. <laughs> no, I went, I went first to Indonesia for a few months. Yeah. Um, and that was an opportunity that the Queensland State Government used to provide. <gasps> Love it. That's long gone now. Um, and it was like a sister state arrangement and it was very good because we got to go and go to school in Indonesia. So it was like year 11 and I went and I studied in Indonesia and uh, went to a local school and completely in Indonesian. Um, wow. So it was a real eye opener and I certainly didn't speak Indonesian very well. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a bit of an interesting time. Um, and that was the days, like this was the 1990s, late 1990s when there was... There was more opportunity and more money for yeah. uh, language exchange type things. And so I then got to do a similar type thing, but with Switzerland. Ooh. And so, uh, so I had a Swiss girl come and stay at my school for a couple of months. And then I went to Switzerland for a couple of months. Oh, that's cool. and, uh, and then after that, I went on another exchange because obviously I couldn't help myself. Yeah. By that <laughs> and I did one of those rotary one year exchanges Ooh, after one high year. school. Yeah, yeah. So that's I went so to cool. Canada for that. So that was that was nice. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. And I'm kind of curious to know what was your first impression of Indonesia. Uh, I remember. I yeah. I I'm trying to remember back because I go to Indonesia. Well, not at the moment, not during <laughs> COVID. But normally I go to Indonesia all the time. Yeah. And I guess over those many years, you build up a familiarity. Yeah. So you kind of forget in some ways uh, what those first things were. were. Yeah, but yeah. I, I remember obviously the food, mm. you know, mm. and uh, I, it's, I don't know, there's a very different energy in Indonesia, if that makes sense. Mm. So yeah. just a far more active and because uh, obviously Spiritual. the populace is much, yeah, yeah, like there's a lot more people around you. Um, and it's, but also a lot more, I don't know, like it's not a, it's not an imposing peopleness. Does that make yeah. sense? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, people are very lovely and they're very friendly and they're very warm and, yeah. um, that can be exhausting sometimes, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but genuinely like, uh, very good hearted sort of people. So yeah. I guess that would be my overall impression. Oh, that's kind of cool. And so when did you, because Guy, he told me, you know, in your 20s, you were listening stories about, you know, violence in Indonesia. And like, where was like, where, like, how did that happen, firstly? <laughs> well, when I was, uh, so I did my undergraduate here as well. I've yeah. just been here at UQ forever. Wow, just you, like Guy. Yeah, yeah well, once you start cool. here, you can never escape. Yeah. yeah so you're, you're an institutional man then, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Guy. Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, so I was an undergraduate student. I got to spend a year in Indonesia as part of my undergraduate studies. Yeah. And which was fabulous yeah. through the excellent Achuchis program, it's called. Anyway, <laughs> and while I was there, I had a friend who was a journalism student and she was doing an assignment. And so she met this lady and she just invited me to come along to interview this woman and I was like, oh, sure, okay. <laughs> anyway, so off, okay. And so she met with this woman and uh, I thought maybe I hadn't understood what she was saying because she kept on talking about how she'd been in prison. Oh. And so at, during the interview, I just sat there <laughs> like a lump on a wood and just yeah. was like, sure, okay, uh, and didn't really say anything. But after the interview, I said to my friend who was studying journalism, I'm like, what was that about? What's this stuff about prison? Surely I misunderstood. And she's like, no, no, no. She's, this woman was one of these people who were in prison in the 60s. And I was like, you're what now? Because people don't talk about it because it's a taboo topic because it was a 
like massive political purges against a particular group and uh, yeah and so after that I got interested and then um, I got to continue my studies and so I ended up interviewing a lot of people for like an honours thesis and then keep going for a PhD and so yeah mm. so it was mainly about people who'd been in these um, in this political internment situation. Wow. So I'm kind of surprised that like, if I like, it must be very sort of confronting to hear it, especially that first conversation. So what made you go back? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> um, I don't know. It was one of those things, I guess, where you, you find something out that you didn't know about and then yeah. you feel compelled a little bit to find out more. Um, yeah. And then I don't really know, to be honest. Um, because you just, why is anyone interested in anything? It's kind of a weird thing to be interested yeah. in. But, um, yeah, I mean, these stories were, they were things I'd never heard before. Um, yeah. It's, again, Indonesians generally really won't talk about it because yeah. it's just something that's, it's politically taboo. It's a bit dangerous to speak about. Yeah. And so no one had been upfront about it before and so finding out that there was this whole sort of generations of people who had been so badly affected by these purges, not just those who'd been killed, and about half a million people were killed at that stage, but there were these millions of other people who were family members or ex-prisoners and they too had been, you know, adversely affected by these purges. And so I guess it was curiosity Morbid curiosity. I don't know. <laughs> it's like that kind of fascinating, but like, yeah. oh no, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but also very compelling sort of stories. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then once you start, you don't stop. <laughs> you know? And you're still going strong? Yeah, yeah. So I still, I still interview people connected to that period, yeah. Yeah, and then so for the audience that doesn't really sort of understand maybe what happened in that period, could you give like a brief sort of like, you know, not too controversial. No, no, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so, all right, so in October 1965, uh, there was an alleged coup. And What's a coup? So, like, an attempt to take over the government. Yeah. And anyway, the long story short is that the Indonesian military, who hated the Indonesian Communist Party, because yeah. this was a political contest kind of thing, um, military blamed the coup on the Indonesian Communist Party, and then the Indonesian military took over the government mm. and wiped out the communists. Mm. Yes. So they, they had a lot of help. They did uh, recruit sort of anti-communist militias from amongst the civilian population to help them kill a lot of communists, right? So, but like communists in Indonesia was a social political group. It was a whole class of people in Indonesia because the Communist Party was the biggest Communist Party in the world outside of China and the Soviet Union at that stage and uh, they had millions of members and so the best estimate we have is about half a million people died mm. and uh, over a million others were put into these um, like detention camps basically which were very bad places um, yeah. and uh, where a lot of people also died in these camps um, and some people sort of were released after a few months or a few years, but others were kept for much longer periods, and so like 10 years or more. Uh, so one woman who I interviewed, she had been in prison for 22 years. Sort of thing. Wow. So she didn't get out until the 1980s. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, had to rebuild her life and yeah. um, track down where her children were because, you know... Oh, that's she, crazy. Yeah, so yeah. it wasn't a... Uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the short version of what oh, happened. Oh, so it was like the people put in prison were mainly from the Communist Party? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so she sort of... That woman you interviewed belonged to... Yes, the, yes, she was a member of... She was a member of the high-up sort of committee within the Communist Party. That's what partly why she was in prison for so long. Oh, hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and then so because, and then the angle that you sort of like looked more into was more about like the salt of women or what was it specifically? Yeah, so I was interested, 
in what had happened to women in this period yeah. because for a start there was very little known about what happened in general so and that's still the case today oh, yeah. still we don't have a good idea of individual dynamics about what happened yeah. how people were killed we have general ideas but not a lot of the specifics um so i was interested in finding out what had happened to women victims you know uh and so I interviewed quite a few women. Yeah, how many did you interview for uh, your thesis? About 150. For your thesis? Yes. But wow. it what was, it, oh. but to be honest, like some of them were larger group interviews. And so yeah. it's not 150 individual testimonies. There's yeah. a few larger group ones that sort of are a bit more difficult to analyse. But anyway, um, <laughs> still way too much data for a PhD, you know, so... <laughs> Uh, so not Wait, all so that was your thesis or PhD? PhD. Oh, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Like so I interviewed about, I think, oh, seven or eight women, I think, or ten women uh, yeah. for my honours thesis, yeah. Yeah, and then also just wondering, see, since it's so taboo, I guess it'd be sort of very, and it's very sensitive, so it'd be very hard to find people. So mm. what was like, you know, like I was kind of wondering about the conversation between you and your supervisor. So was it just you, you know, out of the blue, like, let's do this topic, or was he sort of like, egging you towards that topic or? Uh, well, my supervisor here is a lady, um, Helen Crease, and she retired a couple of years ago oh. now, but she was extremely supportive. She always was. Um, oh. So I think she was a little bit taken aback at first by this topic that I'd chosen, <laughs> but she was extremely and always consistently supportive, even wow. when I got myself into trouble a few times. Wow. Oh. So, oh, it was <laughs> fine. Um, and she helped me get out of trouble, so that was good. Uh, and... I don't know, she was uh, very patient with me as well because I took a very long time to finish my PhD. And uh, <laughs> yeah, but no, no, she was always a, a great supporter and a very good mentor. So yeah, shout yeah. out to her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and kind of curious when you say you got into trouble, was it like, I don't know, government or sensitivity or how does it work? Uh, I got into, well, I had a few challenges in Indonesia. Yeah. with um, a couple of run-ins with local authorities and yeah. uh, there's a very strict uh, research permit system in yeah. Indonesia. I mean, all, all countries govern who can come into the country and conduct research yeah. as a foreign national, that's fair. But uh, Indonesia has quite a sort of, uh, even back then, quite... Um, uh, system of seeing who's doing research and who's doing mm. what, right? And that system is becoming much more surveillance heavy yeah. as we go along, unfortunately. Uh, so I had a few little troubles with authorities, but nothing, nothing too dramatic. So <laughs> it was fine. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so I guess you're starting to run into those troubles during your honours thesis. Well, during my honours thesis, we... Because uh, it's small scale, so I feel like you can sort of, you know, slip on the rug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was doing research back then. Uh, partly, I'd done some of the research while I was an exchange in Indonesia. Wow, good and, on you. Yeah, it was, it was good. And, and looking back, a few, like, uh, ethics should have been done before, not after. Anyway, uh, but the... Um, <laughs> At the time, so this was the early 2000s, yeah. you are way too young to remember this, I'd right? say <laughs> so there was a, um, a large bombing in Bali in 2002 and so I was doing some research there at the time oh. and not, not in Bali, yeah. uh, but when that happened, um, you know how we have a system of travel warnings and levels of risk yeah. to enter certain countries and so Australia put up the travel warning on Indonesia such that all Australian nationals had to leave. Yeah. So, yeah, so that research got cut short. <laughs> <laughs> so I came home about two months earlier than I'd planned to. Oh, yeah. and wait, so like, I'm sort of like thinking about like the timeline. So this was before, so like your degree that you studied was Bachelor of, what was it? Bachelor of Arts. Yep. And then it was just like majoring in Indonesian language. Yep, yep. I ended up having a double major in Indonesian because you could back then because I just did too much Indonesian. So oh, I was supposed to have a major funny. in French and a major in Latin or something, but didn't end up doing it. So Yeah, and so your first exchange, was that in like which year was it in? Uh, I ended up going for the whole of my third year. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And then, okay, and then you like, 
you had your friend and then you watched the interview and then you sort of like um, sort of started collecting data from it yeah. early. Yeah, pretty much. Because you were sure that you wanted to do a thesis or? Yeah, not? but well after that, I so for the year that I was there, the first year was like I was studying in a university, like just doing coursework, yeah. right, like normal, Fun. right? <laughs> and then the second semester you get the option of staying at that university and keep doing more coursework or you could go to another university and do like a field work study. And I was like, oh, all right, I'll do the field work study. So I changed, so I went to another university and that, that semester was like a field study semester. Yeah. So you were much more free to do whatever you wanted to research. So I said, that's yeah. what I'm gonna do. Oh, and then it was cut short. Yeah, then it was cut short, yeah. Oh. So then I had to come back here because I had planned to stay there. But I had to come back, and then so then I wrote my thesis, my honors thesis here. So, oh, so you already scraped all the data you needed? Then... Well, not really. So I had to go back, and I <laughs> had a friend of mine go and um, do like a paper-based interview with yeah. one of the ladies who I'd planned to interview, uh, and she very kindly sort of wrote me a, a written oh, response of wow. the questions I was going to ask. So you know, I had a bit of help there, which was very much appreciated, and. Um, yeah, so it all, it all worked out in the end, but yeah, these people are hard to find and so you need to have a, a contact who can connect you to a network of people because they certainly don't self-identify. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. and when you say paper-based interview, was it that like you like did some sort of online video or no. she just asked the questions? So this room? was 2002. Oh, so. Right. <laughs> so we Shout didn't have... Zoom yeah. existing. Yeah, no, we didn't have anything like that. So I literally said, here are some questions. Yeah. And then she wrote a letter answering the questions. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this woman, yeah. Wow. Wait, so she didn't even sit with the woman? She no, just no, no. She just, she it. took her the, um, well, she knew her and she lived in a different city. So she sent her a letter yeah. with the questions. And then oh. the lady wrote an answer to the questions. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Massively old school. Yeah. 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 Oh. And then, so I'm kind of curious, like, how did you find your first contact? Like, it sounds like a heck load of stalking. Um, how did I find the first contact? Okay, so there was this one woman who, I have her book somewhere on my shelf, Ooh. but God knows where it is. Yes. Could be anywhere. <laughs> Could be anywhere. Let's not even, another one be here for a year trying to find it. Um, <laughs> so she was a lady called Suchina, mm. and she was one of the long-term political prisoners as well. But she was one of the sort of out ones. So she was publicly a former member of this Communist Party group. Oh, yeah. She wrote a book about it. She Ooh. was a, she was a, um, like, person. yeah, like she had written publicly about her experiences yeah. and like everybody else because it's too dangerous to do that. So she had written a book. I contacted the publisher who'd written the book, which is oh. called the Lontar Foundation. And I think it was someone there who put me in contact with her originally. Oh. And she lived in Jakarta. So I went to Jakarta to go yeah. and interview her. And then she knew other people. Yeah. Oh, so it's like one and then that's how you yeah. probably got the other six. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, the, you know, snowballing technique. Um, and, yeah. So I think, I think that's how. Yeah. How long did it take for you to, like, for, like, you see this book, you contact the publisher. How long? Did it take for the response? Oh, I can't even remember. I, it was... Uh, it must have been ages. Uh, it wasn't that long because I'm trying to remember. <laughs> also, like, my friend, the journalism student, she put me in contact with the woman who... Um, she interviewed. She had interviewed. And I never actually ended up interviewing her again. Ah. And I can't remember why because I never saw her again. Not, yeah. not ever. Like, in the years afterwards when I came back to that region... Ah to keep interviewing people. I never saw that lady again. So I have no idea. I don't even know what her name was. But yeah. anyway, so, um, but yeah, it's like once you have sort of one contact, and when I went back to do my PhD research, yeah. I was extremely lucky. I met this, this, this woman who was the one who'd been in prison for 22 years and who was a high up member of the Communist Party and she knew everybody. Oh. Mm. So she introduced me to scores of different people. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's why we have, you know, field work based research. Yeah. Yeah, necessary <laughs> for snowballing techniques, yes. Mm. Yeah. 
I'm also kind of curious, your journalist friend, did she end up like exploring the field as intensely as you did? No, you know? she actually <laughs> unfortunately passed away Aww. quite young from um, a medical problem. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Aww, mm. that's sad. Yeah, and so um, I guess like, are you able with that going into like a lot of detail by saying like, was there like maybe a particular story that affected you the most? Um, I probably can't talk about specifics, but to be honest, the things that I find the hardest to hear, which is terrible, like, because I didn't experience them, you know, um, are stories about children. I find that the worst. Oh, mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Damn. Mm. And I guess, how do you sort of, like, when you listen to these, like, so are we talking mainly just, like, torture, sexual assault? Yeah, so uh, so this, well, if we're talking about this period in the 60s, it yeah. was genocidal, right? So technically genocide can only be committed against certain types of victims, which is a silly thing. Like, uh, so if we think about genocide, most people think about the Holocaust against yeah. Jewish people yeah. and they're a particular ethnic religious group. Um, as one of many examples of genocide around the world. And technically you can only commit genocide against a religious, a racial, an ethnic or a national group. Anyway, in Indonesia it's a socio-political group. So technically, no, it's not genocide because it's yeah. you know a political group. But in all, in all but name, the communist group in Indonesia was a, a stable sort of identity in the sense that people identified and were able to be identified as communists. Yeah. Uh, so it's a particular area of genocide studies that sort of pushes the boundaries a little bit Ooh, because it's, yeah. people get caught up in the legalistic argument about is it or isn't it. But for let's if we forget the label, yeah. you understand what genocide means in terms of the level of violence that it involves. So yes, it's the terrible things that happen when you're wiping out a whole community of people, you know, so there is a lot of killing and there is a lot of sexual violence and uh, because in the Indonesian case there's a, a lot of people who died were imprisoned or detained in some ways before they died and then were executed en masse yeah. and a lot of those people were tortured before they were killed. Yeah. A lot of people who ended up in the prisons were tortured as well. So it's, uh, you know, so all, you know, it's the bad end of human existence, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then I guess, like, if they were intending, maybe like a dumb question, if they were intending to kill them, why didn't they just wipe them all out at once? That would be, in quotes, more, like, effective and efficient if they really wanted to throw them over. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, right? So... Why go to all the trouble of... Yeah, and, like, you kept that woman for, like, 22 years. I'm like, wow, that's, like, a lot of... Oh, it sounds weird. A lot of rice, a lot of feeding, a lot of... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one way to put it. I mean, yeah. certainly there's, there's different arguments around why go to, like... You've got what two are you ends. trying to prove? Yeah, like, there's, there's two sides of this, right? Like, so one is why not just directly massacre yeah. start killing as efficiently as you can yeah. and that's part of the sort of um, like when you look at holocaust debates which are because the holocaust is the most well studied genocide yeah. Yeah. the most of the theory comes from there right and you have these arguments around what are the industrialization uh, motivations that drive that extremely efficient system of killing that develops by the end of the world war ii period it doesn't start out that way it develops over time and then there's arguments, is that instrumentalist or is it developmentalist, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Indonesia, it's a very quick genocide, like the intense killing part of it, but the yeah. persecution lasts for much, much longer, right? Mm. Uh, and in some ways, a lot of genocides have that sort of momentum as well, where you have a more intense period over a short time and yeah. then a long sort of tail afterwards. Yeah. But then you have others that build up like this and so... Not that you're making a scale, but you know, yeah, it's you. the where the intensity of the violence moves in terms of does it happen over a couple of years? Are yeah. uh, things happening over a much longer period? So if you think about 
settler colonial context like mm. Australia, mm. Canada, um, like there was a genocide of Indigenous people here and the killings are happening near the start and a system of labour that enslaves a lot of them as well. But the genocidal impacts of colonialism continue through to today. Mm. So it never really ended. So just because the killings might have stopped doesn't mean that the genocide has stopped because genocide happens not just through killings. So people think of genocide as yeah. purely killing, maiming, torturing, physical, biological sort of things. But there's all these cultural, social, um, ongoing impacts that are still genocidal because they're still about wiping out a group of people. They just take much longer. So this is where the cultural genocide people argument comes around when you wipe out a people's language and all the ways that they communicate culturally to each other, you still effectively wipe them out as a group because all yeah. the things that makes people a group oh. are those ties that hold them together. Yeah. Hmm. Oh. That was a quick introduction to some of the theories yeah, and genocide studies. Yeah, because <laughs> I've never really learned too much about it before. Yeah, it's, so. right, it's a niche area. Yeah, to I mean, be fair. it's like, yeah, it's like, it's grotesque, but it's also, yes. I sort of get you, it's, kind of fascinating in a way mm. because it's like humans did this yeah yeah we do like it a lot crazy yeah. Mm. yeah wait so was there any answer to like the why why not just kill them fast why torture over long periods Is yeah it like a disgusting pleasure thing or well that's it's one part of the answer certainly so i'm actually writing a book with a oh. lady at the moment who so she looks at the rwandan and bosnian genocides and we're comparing in this book the 1960s case in Indonesia with Rwanda in 1994 and then in Bosnia, which was the early 90s period. Um, and we're looking at what is kind of symbolic violence. Okay, so yeah. these are the cases where they tend to be things that are the sadistic type killings. Mm. Like when we think of genocide, we think of the, the horrors of it in terms of, you know, maiming, mutilating, doing things that some, like in a lot of languages, you'll see terms like double killing or oh. killing them twice oh. or doing things to the person or their body that seems to be completely over the top. Yeah. You know, so we're looking at cases within those three genocidal periods and looking at those highly performative symbolic elements to try and unpick what's going on in those cases. Because... Honestly, if you look at the overall number of killings, those types of murders and um, acts of torture are actually the minority of cases. Mm. Most of the time, if you're going to kill half a million people, yeah. you need to do it sort Quick. of, yeah, it takes a lot more than, like you don't, <laughs> this again sounds terribly <laughs> instrumentalist, but yeah. you don't have time yeah. to spend that much, yeah. yeah. So mm, anyway, but but. <laughs> All of these elements go together to make a genocidal period. It's not just one oh, type okay. of killing. It's not just one type of victim. It's not just, well, it's not just one type of actor either. You know, you need active perpetrators. You need people to collaborate with them. You need people to support them. You need bystanders and collaborators of all different levels who might not act be actively killing people, yeah. but they're cooperation and collaboration is necessary nonetheless in order for it to mm. happen so yeah ah okay so it's like probably like a huge majority is just fast killing and then there is the slow killing yeah yeah okay yeah you can yeah it's um the spectacular kind of elements <laughs> of performative killing are important as well because yeah. they're part of the terror and they're yeah. also part of how a group of perpetrators not just communicate to their enemies or yeah. their victims, but also to each other. Ooh. Yeah, because it's part of them socially bonding for each other as well. Yeah, there's all these Ooh. things happening together, really. So we're That's all messed so interesting. up. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So okay. So I like you know, you know. I guess like in the beginning, it's like quite interesting. You're a young student. How how old were you when you first heard that prison story? Uh, how old would I have been? Like 20? Oh my gosh. Hmm, about 20, yeah. Okay, and then you do your PhD on it and that's like another five years or something like oh, that. Oh, eight if we eight take years. that long, yeah. 
took a long time. Yeah. And then so like after the eight years, like, I mean, you've known like, like there's like a huge amount that you've covered. Obviously you can't get everything, but why continue? Uh, well, I think you kind of get, um, you develop an obligation, right? So in the sense that um, I don't want to, obligation sounds like a, a punitive word. It's not, that's not what I mean. Um, yeah. you, you ask people for their stories, right? And they give them to you mm. and you have nothing to give back to them. Oh, right? So is there is an obligation on you to do something with them in a way that would, oh, I don't want to, how do you put this? But <laughs> you're trying to honour the promise that you made sort of thing. So you you went into their life and re-traumatised them and asked them to <laughs> tell their story again, which is a terrible thing. Yeah. You know? It's never a, a healing or a, you know, I got to tell my story and now I feel better. It's never uh, that. It's wh always, why? Well, because it's usually just extremely painful for them, you know, and um, it brings it all up again and it, it re-traumatises them, you know. So you you cause harm to people when you ask them for their story yeah. most of the time and so then you have an obligation on you to do something worthwhile and important with it yeah. in such a way that hopefully <laughs> well the main goal is that it doesn't happen again yeah. <laughs> that's the main goal <laughs> uh but the question of can we actually prevent genocide is another matter but yeah yeah mm. So you keep going with it because, you, you know, you have an obligation. Yeah. So is it that you are sort of like, I guess, you know, at that time um, for your PhD, mm. 150 people. So when you say that you have an obligation, are you like sort of like just using the same data but sort of using it for like new insights or are you going further into the field? Both. So I still go back and I still use the interviews that I did back then because yeah. um, they're... A lot of them are incredibly rich and to be honest, um, I haven't made proper use of a lot of them. There's about 50 interviews that I've hardly touched, which is yeah. shameful to say. Um, and it's, I don't know, but I've kept interviewing more people since then and I do other work with other communities as well. Uh, but I still work... Um, like I'm working on a project to try and collect some of the testimonial materials that different victims from this period have created themselves. Yeah. Because, unfortunately, because most of these people are extremely elderly now, yeah. they're passing away and their materials are being lost. So mm -hmm. we've only got a short window of opportunity to try and save some of those, yeah. their written testimonies, their recorded testimonies, their, their papers, their photographs, there's all these sorts of things. And because this is still a taboo topic in Indonesia and people are still too afraid to talk about it, sadly, these materials are being lost because one, that family members are scared to hold on to them. So oh. when, you know, grandpa passes away, yeah. they're too scared to hold on to them. And so sometimes they get rid of them. Oh, too scared, as in like, they're afraid that like the government sees it and gets in Yeah, well, I mean, it's not just government people, it's also the social surveillance that happens in communities because being connected to the Communist Party oh. is still a socially... Um, it's a bit dangerous. Taboo. Yeah, yeah, so you still, because of the way that they were treated and the way that they, um, they kind of have this, like they have, it's kind of like they're infected with communism. That's yeah. the kind of discourse that they're, they're unclean and they're, yeah. you know, you don't, you don't want to be associated with those people. Yeah, it's almost trying to sort of erase that mm. part of history. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I guess you're preserving it. Yeah, so yeah, so it's working against <laughs> it's, the aims yeah. of the government. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I guess preserving it in hope that, like, we will learn from it and that... Yeah. Yeah. Just learning from the past rather than repeating it and then relearning from a sort of new yeah. kind of event. Yeah, because this period is pretty much denied by the government. So yeah. it, there's a weird sort of dynamic in Indonesia where because the military was in power for so long, yeah. they both sort of denied that it happened yeah. and celebrated it. 
Oh. Yeah, so these killings, so they're called the 1965-66 killings, they are, are both like this matter for extreme pride yeah. that they wiped out this dangerous enemy that yeah. was so bad, you know, that deserved it. Uh, but at the same time, oh, it wasn't us, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's this yeah. weird dynamic. And a good friend of mine, she... Um, uncovered some military documents about 10 years ago uh, and she wrote a book about it um, from so these documents were from Ache and uh, she calls them the genocide files mm. her name's Jess Melvin she's at the University of Sydney and they prove beyond a shadow of the doubt that mm. the Indonesian military planned and carried out this genocide oh. like yeah. <laughs> obviously uh, but these documents prove it, right? And so um, because the military was in power for so long, this discourse that really demonises communists and their families and all the rest of it, such that even their grandchildren and their grandchildren's children are also kind of infected yeah. with communism, uh, that discourse is still really powerful, even though the military government fell like 20 years ago. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I'm also kind of curious about the people that you interview. Are they like, are they wanting to tell their story? Yes and no. Some people are very um, extremely determined, very happy to, very... Yeah, and why? Uh, I guess for a lot of people, uh, so the military government ended at the end of the 1990s and for a period of about five years there, there was a sort of spirit of openness and addressing the past but that's that was a window of opportunity I suppose to be out and be open in the community about it but that window is closed it's yeah. closed for a long time yeah. um, and those very sort of conservative quite fascist forces yeah. are rising again in Indonesia so to be honest I don't think I don't think it would be safe I mean the generation is passing away now, yeah. so so a lot like one the generation will be gone in another few years. Those of direct participants, right? yeah. um, and two the government will probably be back to a military authoritarian government soon. Yeah. So now is kind of the last time in terms of opportunity for people yeah. to speak. If that makes Ooh, sense? Yeah. yeah. It's like sort of speak now or forever. Hold yeah, yeah. Otherwise it'll be like it never happened. Yeah. 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 I guess it's, yeah, it's kind of hard. It's like maybe some, they feel like they want to tell the story, but they also don't want to. Yeah. And they don't know. Yeah. So for some people it's too dangerous. They don't want to bring any kind of repercussions on their families. Yeah. So there were quite a few people who I interviewed who would kind of arrange to meet me in such a way that their family wouldn't know about it Ooh. because they didn't want their family to know about it Yeah. Uh, because they didn't want to endanger their family. Yeah. Now, obviously, I'm not Indonesian. Yeah. <laughs> and I stick out like a sore thumb in yeah. some areas. Um, <laughs> and so meeting this foreigner yeah. often needed to happen in a place where they weren't known yeah. so that... Like, because communities talk, you know. Yeah. And if I had come to their house or something, that would yeah. have caused far too much interest. Hmm. So often I met people in a place away from their local area. Yeah. Um, yeah, which caused them further inconvenience and trouble and all the rest of it. So, you know, yeah. so I was very grateful to people who agreed to meet with me, so... Yeah, and how long do these sort of interviews generally last? Oh, it, massive variance. Um, yeah. Some interviews would go all day. All day. Whoa, like yeah. are we saying like eight hours? Or yeah, are we saying like, like eight oh. hours. Yeah, that was more unusual. Uh, yeah. But a couple of hours usually each time, at least. Yeah, Yeah, and um, how do you sort of start the convo? Well, because <laughs> so I do a, a life history type narrative approach. So okay. that's where you... You don't quite start out with where were you born, but yeah. <laughs> it's, it is a little bit like you start before the time, yeah. you know, where'd you grow up, you know. So you start with, you try and trace a life narrative in the sense that you start with 
you know, where are you from originally? Yeah. You know, when did you, if, because most of my participants were women and it's, mo it's common in Indonesia for women to be married at a certain age and, yeah. you know, so you ask them about when they got married and what they did and all that sort of stuff. And, and then, you know, where were you in the years before yeah. this coup that sort of triggers everything and what were you doing? And then you go into it. You know? and, but you, because with traumatic life narratives, yeah. you can't push and you shouldn't push. Yeah. So you let people sort of guide the direction that they want to go. And sometimes you might try and nudge them back towards certain topics, but you watch for, because you, if they don't want to talk about something, you can't push them. Yeah. So if they don't want to talk about, you know, bad things happening, then you don't push. You know? So you sort of, I guess, if I were to imagine it, you start the convo yeah. sort of from the beginning yeah. and then and then you sort of do like you let go and then you just see where they go with it. Yeah, because often people have an idea already in their head of what they're willing to talk about. Yeah. Um, but it really just depended on the person and the dynamics and often I would, so I rarely interviewed somebody alone. I did. Mm. Mm. Some, some, but generally you needed that contact in the room as well because they don't know me. Why would oh, they trust me? So the I'm just sort some of weird lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So this weird foreign lady comes and asks <laughs> me about this stuff, right? So yeah. that woman who I told you about yeah. who was in prison for all that time, she was often in the room with me for the interviews that I did in the Jakarta area because yeah. uh, that's where she lived. Yeah. And so she'd often be there as well. And so... Sometimes I became quite sort of peripheral yeah. to the interview because the interview was between her and that other one. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd just be sitting there. <laughs> oh, wait, so yeah. that woman who like recommended you a bunch of people, she was the one who She would go questions. with me. She would go with me. Would she be mostly asking the questions? Well, she would often be asking the questions, oh. yeah, because she knew the person, which is how she introduced yeah. me. And she'd be like, all right, now talk about this. Because she knew their life stories, oh. right? And then she would, um, she, she was like the world's absolute best <laughs> uh, informant, to be honest, because yeah. she could tell when I didn't understand, oh. right? And she'd be like, Annie, yeah. this means this, oh. right? <laughs> or, or this person, so this per like, so say the woman was talking about some figure that I should have recognised in yeah. terms of importance or something. She would like do an aside and explain yeah. this person was had this position and they yeah. were important because of blah. And I'd be like, oh, good. Oh. So it was like having like an explanation guide yeah. with the end of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's kind of nice to have like another person. In the oh, room. God, yes. And because that's the thing, like with really difficult, um, sensitive topics, yeah. why would anyone open up about a topic like that? with some random stranger. Yeah. Do you think it's it would have been easier for you if you like looked Indonesian or would have it or do you think it's easier that you don't look Indonesian cuz it's sort of a somewhat distance? Yeah, I've thought about this a few times. <laughs> it's um I think it does two it does a couple of things, right? So yeah. it it changes the dynamic whoever you are. It doesn't yeah. matter like the fact that I'm female, the fact that um I was interviewing women, yeah. but the fact, like, apart from our gender, we had very little in common, right? Like, very different backgrounds, very different, well, just language barriers, things like that. So, I guess, in some ways, me being a foreigner meant that I didn't know them and I didn't know their community. And so, the yeah. things they told me had no chance to go back to their community because yeah. I wasn't going to go and tell. Got the a dog neighbors, so -and -so. yeah, because there, <laughs> yeah. there was there's no possible way that I would do that, yeah. or know how to do that. So, yeah. in some ways, I think, like I ended up, I I ended up focusing on sexual violence for my thesis, but yeah. that's not how I started. Um, okay. I was just going to talk, look generally at what happened to women after this period. You know, I was going to look at economic factors of survival. I was yeah. going to look at how did they raise their families afterwards, all that sort of stuff. And 
just because of the number of stories about sexual violence, yeah. I ended up focusing on that. Oh. Did it take a lot of courage for you to be able to focus on that? Um, not my courage. Their courage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like I didn't... Like, it was their stories. Um, yeah. And it was... It just came out as such a strong thing that yeah, you couldn't I, ignore it. yeah, no, it had to become the sort of centre of the, the the thesis, and then, um, and there was so much of it, and so such a wide variation of different types and situations and yeah. victims and everything that it sort of became the focus. Um, it's not the only thing I've looked at, but yeah. it, that has been a major theme. So, yep. Oh. Mm. And sort of, um, so if you see someone getting emotional in the conversation, what what is the reaction? Because it's like, it's like, don't tell me, but tell me. That kind of, I don't know uh, what happens. Uh, I guess with interviewing for traumatic stuff is that you have to pull your, cause, because we're empathetic beings, right? Yeah. We do things where we reassure and prompt yeah. through, like you're doing it right now, right? So, uh -huh. but, but yeah, in a good way, right? So, okay. by giving me small verbal gestures and angling your body towards me, things like that, right? <laughs> no, I didn't know. They're, they're all things that we do because we're empathetic beings and we're Responding. drawing, yeah, like it's about a response mechanism. But when it's a very upsetting, very um, sad thing where they, have trouble containing emotions because the feelings are too big, right? They need to be able to, it's a stupid way to explain <laughs> it, but they need to be able to push out those feelings yeah. into the space. I'm sounding a little bit too hippie here, right? Yeah. And as such, you need to make room for them to do that. Ooh. All right. So you can't overly show your emotional reaction to what they're saying. So it's about you shutting, not shutting down because you still feel those things, but you have to pull it down so that you're not crying because they're uh, crying. Right? So even though your natural human re yeah. response is to cry with them, yeah. you can't do that because it's not about you feeling bad. It's about letting them have enough room to be able to do that because that's what they need yeah. in order to get those words out. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like each time when it's really intense, I just feel like laughing to sort of ease the... Yeah, and that's yeah. natural. Yeah. Do you ever... Have you ever felt that? Oh, yeah. I do it all the time. I do it all the time. Yeah, have yeah. you ever nearly done that in an interview? Oh, it's, <laughs> it is a really good pressure mechanism, Yeah. to be honest, because you can't just keep crying, yeah. right? There needs to be a, something to... Um, sort of intervene to break the pressure a yeah. little bit. So, and in Indonesian, I don't want to generalise, but yeah. generally in Indonesia, yeah. people use humour yeah. in similar ways, right, to relieve those pressures. Uh, okay, so it's appropriate in Indonesian settings just as it is here where you could have a very sad topic but then someone will try and lighten the mood <laughs> uh, by... You know, you have the nervous laughter and the um, uh, attempts to reassure, even though, yeah. like, the attempts to reassure are essentially meaningless because yeah. how could your assurance ever change anything, right? Yeah. yeah. But uh, it's, I don't know, like... Is that your job, by the way? No. So there's... When you're a researcher... Yeah. Your job there is a researcher, you're oh, not a counsellor. You don't intervene, you just watch. Well, you can certainly offer comfort, mm -hmm. right? So if people are upset, you always give options to stop, to pause, to, mm. to give them time if they want to stop, right? And that's where you have to be guided by what they want to do, right? Mm. And if it becomes over the top, then you eventually have to step in and say, I'm stopping it, right? Yeah. And there's a line that needs to be learned, and then mm. I didn't always get it right. I'm yeah. the first to admit it. But you're not a counsellor. Yeah. 
right? <gasps> and you should never try and act like a counsellor because that's a line where your roles are blurred and yeah. that's unethical. So oh. even if I were a trained counsellor, which I am not, <laughs> um, it would be inappropriate for me to switch roles because I'm here asking you for information. Yeah. It's not my, like it would be ethically wrong for me to then switch roles mid-interview to then say, here I'm going to offer you advice about how you should feel better about me upsetting you. Oh, mm. yeah, I guess it makes you take both sides of opposition. Yeah, yeah. So it's very complicated. Yeah, so if I'm the one, I'm the one causing the harm. Yeah. Right, so yeah. it's not okay for me to then, uh, like, yes, I offer comfort. So when people are crying and upset, you know, you do the thing where you, you try and you move physically close to them. Yeah. Right, it's not appropriate for me to touch you, but anyway, like yeah. <laughs> you, you do touch people as a form of comfort. Right? Yeah. So pre COVID. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's things that you do with your body and your voice and yeah. so when people are upset, people tend to lower their voices and they yeah. tend to whisper. Yeah. Right. And there's all these things that you can try to do that to try to say it's okay to be yeah. upset and we can stop. Yeah. But to be honest, most of the time they just wanted to keep going. Oh, right? okay. So, yeah. Oh, cool. There is so much that I want to talk to you about. <laughs> we have around four minutes, so just going to go for some rapid yeah. fire. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe just short responses. So, like, right. one, I want to know, like, listening to so much of these stories, mm -hmm. like, how has it changed you? Um, oh, God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I should have gotten right, these questions, questions earlier. I don't know. I'm an extremely silly person. So if anything, um, because my work is so serious, yes. uh, it's made me, I don't know, dissociate to the extreme extent. I don't know. Yeah. So that everything else in my life is not as serious at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a funny one. Uh, okay, so I'm wondering, um, does it get easier when you listen to more and why? Does it? Are you distancing yourself? Are you desensitised? Is there such thing? I think you do desensitise, but yeah. then uh, I know my sort of hard limits in yeah. the sense that, um, like, it doesn't matter how many of these things I read or listen to, yeah. anything involving kids, anything involving um, certain types of violence, that yeah. I won't go into details because we don't need yeah. to hear that, <laughs> uh, are still very upsetting. It doesn't matter yeah. how many you hear. Okay, cool. Mm. And then when you're asking yourself, what's the point? How do you sort of answer the question? Well, I guess... Or like, why am I doing this? Or like, why am I putting myself through this? And, you know... I guess at the end of the day, for me, it's, it's got to be about prevention. Right? Oh, so there's yeah. got to be an end goal there in terms of you do it because you don't want to see it happen to others. But it's yeah. a kind of a silly idea in the sense that... Yeah. You're redoing it to the people... Yeah, uh, yeah. ...from the past... And hope for protecting the people from the future. Yeah, and it's something that you'll very unlikely actually be able to enact. Ah, oh, hmm. that's kind of true. Hmm. Mm, okay, and then I guess, what's the meaning of life? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea to, uh, I guess, uh, genuinely try to make the world a slightly better place than when you found it. Sounds good. What is your perfect day in life? Perfect day in life? Oh, goodness. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know, just having good company and uh, good times and uh, <laughs> hopefully, uh, I don't know, helping people. Yeah. And I guess when you've listened and, like, done all of this work, does it sort of, like, um, I don't know, like, how, how can you return to everyday life and how do you sort of fit back in with, like, you know, you're like you're trying to explain to your friend, but they don't they don't understand that they, they weren't there. Yeah, I guess um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't know. Uh, I, I you need a way to switch off. Yes, uh, but at the same time, oh, that's too hard a question. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I can answer that. I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, yeah, I don't think I don't I don't think there's a way to answer that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. We better go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>